there by your knees. Greetings, my name is Dr. Robert Gish. I'm working on a project in collaboration, in collaboration with Renown Health and Stanford University. We're going to be talking about the overview of the care of the liver patient in the hospital and when to consider a transfer, and this means a transfer from outside the hospital into the hospital or maybe a transfer to an alternate uh, center, liver center such as Stanford. And thanks a lot for being here today, and I want to thank uh, very much Denise Wiley for helping to organize this, and Susan Cox, who's been instrumental. My partners in this project includes Craig Sandy, uh, Tim Alterman, and the gastroenterologist in the Reno Basin. Thank you. Let's start out talking about liver enzymes and liver function. Back in the old days, liver function tests included liver enzymes, but no longer. At this time, we separate out these tests into two separate baskets. One basket is liver enzymes, AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase, and GGT. Those are not liver function tests. We have true liver function tests, which are bilirubin, albumin, bicarb, factor V, factor VII, lactate, cholesterol, and now thromboelastography, TAG. What's missing from this, you might notice, is ammonia. Ammonia is probably the worst liver function test and should not be used in most clinical settings. Although the level of ammonia in the arterial blood, when drawn correctly, tends to be elevated in patients with advanced liver dysfunction, especially when there's substantial shunting. It's poorly correlated with the patient's clinical status and grade of encephalopathy. Therefore, it's of little use. And my advice is don't order ammonia testing unless you have a very special clinical setting, such as unexplained coma in a patient with no liver disease. This could be a urea cycle defect or deficiency, a genetic disorder. This might be seen in the emergency room, for example. Let's now switch to staging our patients. When you're taking a call about a transfer or thinking about inpatient care of a liver patient, you need to score patients with two systems, child Q and the MELD score. And those both should be in the chart you're defining your patient's clinical status, and when you're describing a patient to a colleague or you're taking an incoming call, that referring provider should know these two scores. You want to know on every liver patient their encephalopathy grade, whether they have ascites and it's moderate, mild, moderate, or severe, or absent, bilirubin in milligrams per deciliter, albumin, normal is really over 4, but in this case over 3.5. And then you're going to be thinking about the INR, 1.7 and above is marked dysfunction. And then, of course, there's much higher levels of INR. But INR, we'll talk about in terms of thromboelastography, is a very poor test to determine leading risk or what to do. The next slide talks about grading encephalopathy. Zero is normal, and then zero is actually broken down into uh, none and covert or hidden encephalopathy. And then there's grade one, two, three, and four with signs such as day-night sleep reversal, asterixis, poor memory, degradation in handwriting, and then eventually coma uh, in those patients with real severe forms. So this grading of encephalopathy is part of the CPT score and it's part of your clinical note on patients with acute or chronic liver failure. The other system is MELD. It's a combination of creatinine, bilirubin, and INR. You need to go online to do this calculation. The MELD score in a normal cirrhotic, a cirrhotic with no liver dysfunction, is less than six. And then once a patient has a MELD score of over 15, that's when we think about sending them for a liver transplant evaluation. And a MELD of over 25 to 30, that patient has a very poor short-term survival. So basically, in this transfer concept and care of these patients, you need to move patients to a hospital setting or to a higher level of care when their MELD is over 15, and those patients should be at a transplant center if they're a transplant candidate when that MELD is in the 15 to 25 range. 
Of course, with their mills 18, they're stable, they can be discharged, that patient could go home potentially and then be seen in a liver clinic. We, of course, have uh, Stanford outreach clinics monthly in uh, uh, Reno, and we're available to see patients in consult if they're stable outpatients. Clearly, we want to transfer those patients. We need an expedited liver transplant evaluation and listing. Meld over 15, call and discuss. Meld over 25, refer. 15 heading towards 25, transfer that patient. It might be a transfer in from an outside facility in the region around Reno or moving them to a transplant center. Similar concept in terms of timing. To go back to encephalopathy just for a second, asterixis is your best test. You can train the patient and the patient's family to do asterixis testing at home. You don't need ammonia testing. And of course, you can do handwriting and memory and other issues. Grade three hepatic encephalopathy means transfer, bringing those patients into renown or sending those patients to a transfer center. They're transplant candidates, they're in renown. Our next discussion is about hepatorenal syndrome. As you know, patients with liver failure and renal failure, with renal failure due to liver failure, the renal disease is completely reversible by treating their liver disease, especially if they get a liver transplant. Let's go into some more depth about hepatorenal syndrome. And of course, this is a reason to transfer a patient from your referring hospitals into renown then stabilize the patient. If they're transplant candidates, you think they're transplant candidates, then it's time to transfer those patients. And um, of course, my linkage is to the Stanford Liver Transplant Center. Updated criteria for hepatorenal syndrome. <coughs> Low GFR, serum creatinine greater than 1.5, or serum creatinine greater than 2.5 and doubled in the last two weeks. And just a little bit new information is, in a liver patient, a change in creatinine of 0.3 milligrams per deciliter is considered strongly clinically significant. Now, if they have shock, low blood pressure, they probably have ATN, and not have an renal syndrome. They've got some severe fluid losses from overuse of lactulose, for instance, or excess use of diuretics. That's probably ATN. You give them a withdrawal, period with infusion, creatinine still the same or going up, that's most likely hepatorenal syndrome, and do a urinalysis, do an ultrasound of their kidneys, make sure we're not looking at another issue such as obstruction or they don't have a disease like nephrotic syndrome or glomerulonephritis. There's three types of hepatorenal syndrome, one, rapidly progressive, two, moderate, more slowly progressive renal dysfunction, type three, more proposed, looking like very, very slow progression and may occur in the setting of other problems such as chronic renal insufficiency. The therapies for hepatorenal syndrome, you can even start this before they're transferred into renown. They should definitely be on it when they get here. Octreotide, albumin, and metadrine. There are other choices of other drugs or options or interventions that may help these patients. And in fact, tip shunt can help two-thirds of patients with hepatorenal syndrome. The problem is one-third get worse. It's expensive, complicated by hepatic encephalopathy, volume overload. So tip shunts we'll be talking about later. And of course, liver transplantation is the best treatment for hepatorenal syndrome. You have triad the octreotide minidin trial looked at sub-Q 100 to 200 mics three times a day. This is not IV octreotide that you would be using in somebody with GI bleeding. It's obviously much less expensive. And the best is minidin, 10 milligrams every eight hours. You want to get the maps up by about 15. This increases renal perfusion. You're going to leave them on this for up to 20 days, depending on their renal status. And some small studies were done, but they're very, very compelling in terms of outcome. And dopamine, you don't use because there's really good data now that dopamine probably worsens overall clinical cardiac and renal status in patients. So MOA is the treatment of choice for hepatorenal syndrome. Another study retrospective, 81 patients, 
worked out with octreotide and metadrin. Sustained improvement in renal function, 40% in the MOA group, less 30 and 90 day mortality. But look at how high the mortality rate is in general. Hepatorenal syndrome would mean get them to a liver transplant center or discuss hospice with patients who are not improving on a substantial basis. We don't use dopamine, we try to avoid norepinephrine or neosinephrine. neosinephrine. Norepine and hepatorenal syndrome is compared to terlipressin, which is available in Europe but not in the United States. Patients in both groups received albumin, 20 to 40 grams per day. Typical supplementation you would also use as part of MOA. Norepinephrine was also used with a target MAP, randomized but unblinded. Or epinephrine looked very similar to terlipressin. Terlipressin is already approved in Europe for renal syndrome, so this is an alternate choice for pressors if your metadrin is not working. Let's now talk about GI bleeding. Very important issue in cirrhotics with portal hypertension. To transfer that patient into renown for a potential endoscopy or tip shunt intervention, uh, looking for peptic disease, short term proton pump inhibitors if they're not stabilized and bleeding is not controlled in an outlying hospital. You're not able to control their bleeding at renown. Reason to transfer those patients to Stanford might be portal vein thrombosis. There are other newer techniques such as dips shunts that are shunts that can go across the caudate lobe between the remnant portal vein and the inferior vena cava. Also, liver transplantation may be possible. There may be ways to do uh, thrombolysis to remove that clot in the portal vein. So, that's things to think about. GI bleeding in a cirrhotic patient, the person gets admitted to the hospital. Outside hospital, not being controlled or slow bleeding, transfer into renown, and then think about that as a reason for referral for liver transplant, or I call it quaternary care, because really renown is serving here as a tertiary care hospital. IV antibiotics. I really encourage you to read these protocols that have been developed by Timothy Halterman, Dr. Halterman, Dr. Sandy, and myself that are in the system here for managing uh, inpatients with various liver problems. Antibiotics, standard of care, in a GI bleed, whether it's portal hypertension or peptic in somebody with cirrhosis. This saves lives. This is the uh, best measure, best outcomes, best practices. A little bit more on GI bleeding. Depends on the patient's status, but if they've got a high bilirubin or ascites, they have a very high, short, and intermediate term mortality rate. Urgent upper endoscopy. There's no reason to not place an NG tube. NG tubes do not lacerate esophageal varices. They don't knock off bands. They're not a problem. And of course, if you find peptic disease, you're going to use IV PPIs. You may use IV uh, proton pump inhibitors short term, but remember long term PPIs may increase the risk of bacterial peritonitis. We know they do increase the risk of C. difficile, low magnesium, and calcium levels. Non selective beta blockers within the standard of care of managing portal hypertensive bleeding, but really it's about prophylaxis, not acute treatment. So if someone comes in with a low blood pressure with varices and bleeding, you stop their beta blockers. We also know now that beta blockers are a problem in patients with portal hypertension, GI bleeding, and ascites, and those patients have a worse outcome. Cardiac echoes really should be the standard of care of working up patients in the hospital, especially a new patient. Patients with ascites have a ascites cirrhotic type cardiomyopathy. This may be left ventricular dysfunction, slightly low ejection fraction, abnormal E to A change on the atrial um, measurements and calculations on the echo. So really have a low threshold to evaluate that liver patient who's decompensating, slightly low blood pressure, not improving with a cardiac echo, and look for uh, ventricular dysfunction. Just a picture of endoscopic variceal ligation, placing the two, suction, band placement, and remnant uh, web. Nice book.
photograph now instead of a diagram. Upper left, new band just placed. Upper right, multiple bands. Lower left, endoscopy about a week after bands are placed. Uh, lower right, uh, probably a week and a half to two weeks, bands have fallen off and some minor peptic changes or scar tissue, eschar. Nasogastric tubes are very useful. They can confirm bleeding, the amount of bleeding, whether bleeding is stopped. Do not use continuous suction for more than one or two hours. Continuous suction long term can result in bowel wall ischemia in the stomach and potentially even perforation. Once the bleeding is dumped on, remove the tube. And uh, remember, NG tubes don't cause variceal bleeding. It's going to be very rare that you'll need to use a Minnesota tube. If you do, you need to have an expert who knows how to place and maintain that tube. It's another hour discussion. We're just going to mention it briefly. Somebody with a Minnesota tube in place needs to be transferred, and obviously it's renowned. It's a primary uh, transfer site. Think about that patient being a transplant candidate after conferring with the transfer uh, transplant center, such as Stanford. A diagram about tip shunt is placed in the uh, internal jugular position, goes down in through the right atrium to the hepatic veins. First, the wire and probe is placed across, and then a balloon is dilated that, and a stent is placed to follow. Let's now talk a little bit more about ascites. Kind of gone down that road because people with hepatorenal syndrome only get hepatorenal syndrome if they have ascites. No ascites, it's not hepatorenal syndrome. Just keep that as a paradigm uh, item. Tractable ascites, hepatocytothorax. Patient needs to be transferred in for more aggressive management and maybe a transplant candidate considered to be then transferred to a transplant center. Just think about this. You have a patient with ascites in front of you. You wait for a paracentesis to see if they have pain or a fever or a white count over 10,000. The answer is no. Paracentesis always is done in a patient with ascites, an initial presentation, or with any sign of clinical change. A white count that goes from a base for a patient of 2,500 to 5,000, that's a huge change in the total white count any left shift, any abdominal pain, low-grade fever, hypothermia, slight change in their creatinine or renal function, any clinical change could indicate SVP. So chest pain equals an EKG, ascites equals a paracentesis at the bedside, fluid put at the bedside and blood culture bottles. That is the standard of care. Any delay in paracentesis, would not meet quality metrics. If you aren't culturing at the bed bedside, the ascites fluid in a blood culture bottle, that is not going to meet quality guidelines. Very important issues, important take home messages. In the emergency room, it's where we want the paracentesis done. You do not need to get coagulation tests on patients except maybe to prove the platelet counts over 20,000. Patients who get diagnostic or therapeutic paracentesis, ultrasound guided with moderate to small insertable catheters, do not need any coagulation support. INR 4 or 5, platelet count 40,000, no coagulation support. There are risks of blood clot products, volume overload, infection, transfusion related acute lung injury. Those risks are much higher than bleeding from a paracentesis. So this time, paracentesis do not require blood product transfusion. They just require ultrasound guidance and a platelet count over 20,000. What do you send? Besides the fluid and blood culture bottles at the bedside, always get a differential, always get an albumin, always get a total protein. Then there's special things you can do lung cultures, cytology, triglycerides, other items that you can think about, but these are the top four things that have to happen in every patient. Patients who come in with SVP, albumin is the standard of care. There's albumin guidelines and protocols that have been developed by the liver group here at Renown. Look at those guidelines and protocols for dosing the albumin. It changes mortality. It changes renal function. It decreases infection risk 
You've got ascites, you think you have SPP, you're getting albumin. You've got ascites, they get a paracentesis. Large volume paracentesis should be avoided unless absolutely necessary due to severe pain or respiratory compromise, diuretic refractory or resistant. You can probably take out four liters without albumin, but have a low threshold for albumin infusion. We don't like to do paracentesis since this can de deplete protein stores in status in a patient. Indwelling catheters are not used for ascites management unless in late stage cancer and it's palliative. Always use ultrasound guidance, extremely important. Bedside ultrasound, not send them to radiology, get a marking, do it at the bedside, very important. We talked about the issue of coagulation, here at Renown, you'll have a tag on all these patients. They'll be very comfortable not giving blood products. Tips we talked about, not just for GI bleeding, but for ascites management. It's effective in seven to eight out of 10 patients. Most recently, these covered stents have a very, very long half-life, but you are not gonna put a tip shunt in a patient with active encephalopathy or a bilirubin over three or a meld over 23. Clearly transfer to a specialty center if there's portal vein thrombosis or thrombolysis, special tip shunt placement, or maybe dip shunt. And of course, liver cancer is a contraindication to tips. All these considerations need to be taken place when you're thinking about transferring that patient into renown or to an outlying liver center such as Stanford Liver Transplant Center. A little bit more on tips. There's different types of surgical shunts that can be considered, although they're rarely done. We do not do Denver or Levine shunts now in almost any patient. If you can't place the tips or the tips is failing, liver transplant may be accelerated, but as you know, organs are distributed based on meld scores. One more picture of the tip shunt, which we went through earlier. We're now gonna switch gears. Acute liver failure. Fulminant, hepatic encephalopathy within two weeks of jaundice, subfulminant, hepatic encephalopathy two weeks to 12 weeks from onset of jaundice. Patient with hepatic encephalopathy, acute liver injury needs to be in the hospital, either admitted or transferred, and then that patient needs to be looked at as a transplant candidate to move to a transplant center, especially if there's progression of liver function or encephalopathy not getting a reversal with some early intervention, an early call to a transplant center such as Stanford is very important. You have rapid onset acute, slow onset, but it's all timeline, take a good history, look at the trajectory, look at the liver function, get a tag. The causes of acute liver failure are listed here. Really, it was a long discussion, so I'm just putting them up. The bottom line is they need to be in the hospital, transferred in from an outside center in consideration of transfer to a transplant center. More on acute liver failure definitions. Thinking about measuring that patient's mental status, but really you're gonna back up and say, did this patient have chronic liver disease? Could this be acute on chronic as opposed to fulminant hepatic failure or acute liver failure? So take a good history, look at scans, strongly consider a liver biopsy in these patients. Liver biopsies help immensely with prognosis and management. Acute liver failure, new onset hepatic encephalopathy, move to a transplant center if that patient's a transplant candidate. Always obtain all acute liver failure patients on admission or in the ER, set a medicine level, full tox screen, blood alcohol, glucose, phosphorus, INR, and liver panel as an absolute minimum. You're also going to be thinking about viral hepatitis and autoimmune workup. It's a long discussion and we'll be presenting that at a separate lecture, but these are very important to think about immediately. Admit until proven otherwise, admission if any encephalopathy, admit if arising creatinine. Monitor very closely for low glucose. They can die from hypoglycemic seizures. The phosphorus is low and not replaced. Those patients are at very high risk of abrogation of liver regeneration and can die. 
replace phosphorus aggressively. Here at Renown, we have a phosphorus replacement protocol that should be followed to the letter with monitoring and infusions. Please look at that protocol and refer. Bilirubin, over 10 and rising. Very serious sign. Remember, bilirubin is really the best liver function test out of all the different markers. Fulbin hepatic failure. Well, we're not really putting in ICP monitors anymore, but <clears throat> central pressures are useful. Hypothermia, propofol, elevate the head of the bed, sandbag that head so it's not moving right or left. And if you're doing all these things, working on movement to a transplant center will be very important. We like D10 to keep the glucose elevated, aggressive phosphorus replacement. Think about gastric pH determination, and don't just throw PPIs at every patient, really be thoughtful. Liver biopsy has been very useful in the past in evaluating cause and prognosis. Factor V and Factor VII levels are quite useful also for prognosis, as well as lactate levels. There's the King's College criteria, got INR, pH, creatinine, age, timing of jaundice to HE, and how many predictors are there. So a little bit different between acetaminophen and non-acetaminophen. Acetaminophen toxicity is very common, but your history may be very inaccurate. Always get a blood level, and if elevated, N-acetylcysteine. But these days, we're using N-acetylcysteine for all acute liver failure patients. So IV for three days, then switch to PO is probably a little bit more cost-effective and useful. NAC, multiple different sources, low threshold to use in your patients. Right now, we're not using it aggressively for alcoholic hepatitis, but it's an option. Primary and secondary outcomes in the N-acetylcysteine trials show a benefit. This has been shown in sedimentophen and all cause acute liver failure. Look at all the medications that can cause acute liver failure. Take a good history. Try to find out what that source was. Talked a lot about encephalopathy, but I'm going to hit just a few more highlights. Grading, we went over to carry this card in your iPad, iPhone, Android, someplace you can look this up easily. Remember, it's all of these different toxins, short chain fatty acids. Um, other types of amino acids. Uh, ammonia is part of it, but ammonia doesn't cause encephalopathy unless there's inflammation, such as a GI bleed, dumping toxins into the body. So it's really a combination of toxins and inflammation that cause that acute liver injury, sorry, acute um, brain injury resulting in encephalopathy. Manage brain edema, <clears throat> multiple steps, but you want to keep the patient fairly dry but you have to balance that with brain perfusion and low blood pressure. But remember, our liver patients live as systolics of 90 to 95 without any direct immediate compromise. Talk about urea cycle deficiencies. The only time I ever measure ammonia levels is in these patients where I think there's something suspicious that encephalopathy with the liver tests are normal. A little bit more in ammonia trafficking, moves around the brain, the liver, muscle, Viscera, affecting blood levels, making this even more confusing, and why not to check blood among the levels? So, what can precipitate, what can worsen too much dietary protein, such as giant, you know, one and a half pound steak, but 100 grams of protein is normal, doesn't influence encephalopathy. Constipation. Patients with cirrhosis should be having one to two bowel movements a day with lactulose or a mixture of lactulose and Miralax. Don't let your patient become constipated. They should be eating six meals a day with a split of 100 grams of protein, fluid restriction, make sure your patient's not dehydrated. That low sodium can be terrible for hepatic encephalopathy. Get that corrected within three to five days. Massive blood loading, whole issue about intestinal glutaminase that might be involved with metabolizing proteins to ammonia. Any infection resulting in inflammation can set this problem off. 
blood, not just in the GI tract, but blood inside the circulation can worsen encephalopathy. And finally, not just hyponatremia, but hypokinemia. Alkalosis, contraction alkalosis from overdiagnosis will worsen hepatic encephalopathy in many patients. Anemia, of course, can make things worse. Arterial hyprox uh, hypoxemia can make things worse. Different medications can make things worse, including benzodiazepine. Other issues, well, we're going to do lactulose. Really going to target not four bowel movements a day, but two a day. You're going to add rifaximin. Never use neomycin. Zinc can be useful short term. We talked about probiotics, although the data in the hospitals is not very clear. Outpatients, probiotics may be good. We emphasize that a low sodium can markedly worsen hepatic encephalopathy. So a major focus in the hospital is to get that sodium up. We had a patient with encephalopathy at an outlying hospital, and the sodium's 119. You need to bring them through now and work on getting that sodium fixed. I would refer you to our protocols and uh, other slide presentations. You can do 3% sodium chloride infusions, free water restriction, and ultimately, you can use bath tans. Medications. You're never going to use non-steroidals in a cirrhotic. Aminoglycosides is always another choice. Sleeping medications will be cautious. On the right side is preferred medications. And here we talked about acetaminophen being a problem, but at low doses, under 2 grams per day, I'm estimating no problems. Finally, as we get close to the end, we need you to keep you aware of hepatoadrenal syndrome. This is adrenal insufficiency seen in cirrhotic patients and it's probably seen in a third of patients with cirrhosis. We don't know why. But this would mean in some patients with persistently low blood pressure or electrolyte abnormalities that may hint at one of these problems, that they need to be on not just steroid replacement, stress doses, but maybe a candidate for dialysis. In summary, we're going to transfer patients into Renown with a very low threshold and move them to Stanford by calling me at 858-229-9865. But you can call the Stanford Transfer Center, call the on-call hepatologist. But you need to be looking for all these other causes that might be making encephalopathy worse. Health syndrome, we're going to transfer. Chronic liver disease with bad hepatopulmonary new onset of carry, very new onset portal vein thrombosis, and of course, hydrated biliary obstruction. I'd like to thank you for the special opportunity to present this information to you today, and have a good day. This is Robert Gish, partnering with the renowned Litter Group, a clinical professor, consultant at Stanford University. Thank you so much. <laughs>